Amen. How many are ready? Are you ready for the word this morning? Amen. Praise the Lord. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. If everybody could just stand, open up your Bibles just one more time. I know we do a lot of standing and sitting, but that's so that your blood gets flowing and you don't fall asleep on me. Hallelujah. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. If you got your Bible, you can go ahead and open it up. And if you don't, just lock in with me and I will read it for you. The Bible reads like this in First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model. Somebody say a model. To all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, the Lord's message rang out from you. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Father, I pray one more time that you would bless this morning's time. I pray for those that need to be encouraged. You would encourage those that need a confirmation, you would give a confirmation. Those that just need a simple touch from you, that this morning would be a morning that you reveal yourself to the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name, and everybody together said, amen. You could go ahead and be seated this morning. Now, this morning, I really felt that it was uh, real relevant to take a look at the church of Thessalonica. And the Bible speaks about here the testimony that they had from somebody that was on the outside looking in. And sometimes when you're on the inside, it's hard to see what others see. And for us as a ministry, Victory Outreach, especially coming from another country, I believe that the same way the Apostle Paul looked to the church of Thessalonica as a church that was a model church, as a church that was despite of anything and everything that they went through, they continued to be a church that was an example to the world around them. I believe that that is similar to the church right here in the city of Eagle Rock. That throughout the last 30 plus years, Victory Outreach Eagle Rock has, despite severe suffering, come on somebody, how many of you went through a few things? Oh, some of you had a perfect role, hallelujah, I got to get a little closer to you, come on somebody, but how many know Christianity sometimes has its ups, its downs, and all arounds? How many have had their good times and their bad times? In South Africa, we sing a song, good times or bad times, happy or sad times. God deserves the glory. He deserves the praise. No matter the circumstance. How many know there is good times, but there's also bad times? Victory Outreach, Eagle Rock, the good times or the bad times has not taken you from being the church that God has called you to become. I want you to give yourself a round of applause. Praise the Lord. That despite severe suffering, despite trial, despite battle, the ministry of Victory Outreach Eagle Rock has continued to take their place in the vision of Victory Outreach International. And therefore, your faith has become known everywhere. Whether you know it or not. Not just in the avenues. Come on, somebody. Not just here in this neighborhood or that neighborhood. But Nigeria knows about Jesus because of Victory Outreach Eagle Rock. Liberia knows about Jesus because of Victory Outreach Eagle Rock. Cape Town, South Africa. You know that it took me 32 hours to get here in a plane. Come on, so 32 hours. I didn't even know what day it was. I thought it was already Christmas, brother. I said, hallelujah, Feliz Navidad. My God. But because of your faith in Christ and because of your perseverance, there are hurting people in different countries and different continents. And because you have played your part within the vision that God has given to Victory Outreach International, that not only are you reaching your community, but your faith in God has become known everywhere. Panama, hallelujah. Guadalajara, hallelujah. How many know we have a vision for the inner cities of the world. This church here in Thessalonica, God had his hand upon this church. And I believe that God also has his hand upon Victory Outreach Eagle Rock. There were a few qualities that this church had that allowed this church to become the church that God called it to be. And I believe we also can make sure that not only we hear about these qualities, but we too possess these qualities. The first one was that they possessed the power of God. Somebody say the power of God. That what was taking place in Thessalonica was not a move of man, was not some, 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 some teaching that somebody gave and they took run with it, but it was the move of God. They needed to understand that what was taking place in their midst 
had nothing to do with Paul. Although Paul was the vessel, but Paul did not give birth to that church. God himself had given birth to the church of Thessalonica. It was not a man thing, but it was a God thing. The book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 4 says, For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. See, it was very important for the people that were in the church of Thessalonica to understand that what was taking place within that church was not an act of man, but an act of God. How many know man can disappoint? Man can let us down. And how many know that as we come into the house of God, although God will use man and we respect and honor the leadership that God puts in place, but we also have to keep perspective that although God uses man, God don't need man. God does what he wants to do. Man cannot change life. Psychological a theory cannot change life. Education cannot change life. But it can help enhance life. I'm not against it. But when you come in, they say if your car is broken, take it to the mechanic. But when your life is broken, bring it to church. Because there's one inside of the church that is able to transform a person's situation. I came into the house of God 20 years ago with a father that was on drugs and a mother that was on drugs but little by little by little my entire family got delivered and saved and took their place in the house of God God took my situation and turned it around what man could not do what prison could not do what the what, what Oprah Winfrey couldn't do come on somebody what Dr. Phil couldn't do the grace and the mercy of God in the house of God changed my family if you've had an experience like that I need you to clap just a little bit if you know that it was God and not man, I want you to put your hands together. If you knew that just at the right time, Jesus stepped in and did a miracle in your life, I need you to clap a little bit. I need you to give him one of those, I know it was God type of claps. Man could not do it, but God did it. He says, we know that God has chosen you. Because my message came to you not with simple words, but with power. Now, how did they know there was power? There was a few things that gave evidence that it was God's power. The first one was, there was true change that took place in the hearts of people. See, the people that were coming into the church of Thessalonica were mostly coming from pagan and occult worship. So after coming to Paul and hearing the message... They would go home and be surrounded by their former way of life. But they were not going back, although they were surrounded by it, they were not getting entangled with it. They would go back to their former way of, of, of go be surrounded by the former way of living or the former way of worship, but they themselves were still able to live above the worship that was going on around them. See, Paul, when he would go into a city, he would first go to the synagogue and he would share the message of Jesus. The gospel is first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. So after they would not respond, then he would go to the Gentile. Gentiles were considered unclean people. They had their own way of worship. Some of the Greeks, come on somebody, they were philosophers. And the apostle Paul knew that his education, although he was a very educated man, his education alone, he could not persuade them. Because serving Christ is not something you can be persuaded into. Serving Christ is something you have to be transformed into. The Bible says that you came from the darkness into his marvelous light. You were once this, but then you became this. The Bible says when you come to Christ, you're a new creation. And the old is gone and the new has come. In other words, there's a transformation not only in mind, but in everything about us. There's a change that takes place. And when changes takes place, you don't go back to the way you used to live. Come on, somebody. For me, it was drugs. I used to smoke meth. In, in South Africa, they call it tuk. I said, tuk. They said, yeah, tuk. I said, tuk. He said, yeah, tuk. I said, tuk, tuk. Come on, somebody. <laughs> when I was a young boy, we used to break dance in the street. Tuk, tuk, tuk. Tuk, come on, somebody. 
ha, and that was the only took I know, hallelujah. But when I came into the ministry, I, I smoked took, I smoked meth, I smoked about three and a half grams a day, smoking. Rawr. Staying up day after day after day. Come on, somebody. But when I came into the house of God, God delivered me. So now, and then I remember, I knew I was delivered. You know how I knew I was delivered? Because we would go evangelizing. We would go to the streets when we were in the homes. And I'm sure you guys still do it. They would send us back like the woman by the well. The Bible says that after she experienced Jesus, she went and told everybody she knew, I met a man. He told me everything I ever did. I was with five men, right? And the one I was with was not even my husband. But he didn't look at my failures. He didn't look at my faults. He gave me water that I would not thirst no more. And the Bible says the whole city came to meet Jesus. Then they said, we came because you told us. But now that we've experienced for ourselves. Come on, somebody. So when I knew that there was true change in my life is when I would go evangelize, Hoff. We would go back to the neighborhood that we came from. And they would be in the garage. They were garage tweaks, you know, <laughs> blowing uh, uh, pipes with the torch. <laughs> they had creative guys, you know. That's why she said creativity. You know? There were some creative dope fiends out there, too. Come on, somebody. We had one guy that would twist the, uh, the neck. Some of you that were meth heads, some of you are looking at me like, oh, my God, these people are crazy. <laughs> yeah, this was the lifestyle. It was pretty heavy. And, we, and they would get pliers, and they had a torch, and they would twist this thing, and when it would dry, it had like little edges, and the idea was, while I smoke, it'll get caught in the edges, so when I don't have anything, I could burn the neck. Come on, somebody. <laughs> wow, right? So after I got my touch from God, right, and I'm just, you know, keeping it humorous to keep you with me, my point is, that no matter what life you come from, everybody got their own story here. You didn't come to church because you was perfect. Come on, somebody. You were searching. You were searching, searching. Some of you came in, searching, searching for my baby. Yes, I am. Searching for my baby. Come on, somebody. Huh? You were searching for something. There was some type of emptiness that was going on in your life. And you come to the house of God. And you try to meet that need through this or try to meet that need through that. And you come to Jesus. And the way you know true change has taken place is when I would go back to the garage. And I was witnessing. And there they were doing the things that I used to do. Smoking. And my heart was beating a thousand miles an hour, Pastor Augie. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And then all of a sudden it was like, I don't even want this no more. So my heart... Stop beating so fast. And I started looking at them. I said, look at me. You know me. The pipe you're smoking, I used to smoke. The things you're doing, I used to do. But I'm not doing it no more. And you're not going to find that joy in that pipe. Look at my life has been changed. The lifestyle I was living, I was able to live above. Why? Because man's words will persuade you. But God's power will transform you. And so therefore I knew what I had experienced in the ministry of Victory Outreach was not a move of man, but it was a move of God. If you have been transformed by God, I need you to clap just a little bit there was a true change for 20 years when we were in Indonesia the, the, the Muslims they, they don't play you get high they stone you throw gasoline on you and light you on fire yeah you say yo America you're very you know you're very I don't care what you say about America I don't care what wall they want to build or what, what, whatever is going on over here. You got it good. Come on, somebody. I don't care what's going on out there. You got to be careful because in some of these countries, some heavy stuff. So we would go under the bridge. They would be hiding under bridges. And there they would use heroin. And they'd be under there with candles, lighting spoons. And I would go under that bridge, and there was about 20 of them. And I started testifying to them. I said, listen. You know, I used to smoke, so now I'm in the same surrounding. 
How do you know you've been transformed? When you can go back to what you came from and it doesn't affect you no more. It doesn't affect you no more. Even that depressing situation doesn't affect you anymore. You got joy unspeakable and full of glory. So even though the situation hasn't changed, something internally has changed. So you don't look at that situation no more. That son that's still running crazy, that husband that's still running crazy, it doesn't have an effect on you anymore because you've been transformed by the power of God. And so you got joy. And because that man didn't give it, that man can't take it. Because that situation didn't give it that situation can't take it Jesus gave it and he will never take it away how many got joy here this morning how many got peace that nobody else can take away the Bible calls it peace that surpasses all understanding God did something in your life that no one can take away we would go under that bridge and we would witness to them and I would say listen and I had a translator and I would say listen you're here, but you're tired. You don't want to use that drug no more. You don't want to be under this bridge no more. Come home with me. Muslims under that bridge would come and jump in the van with us. And then I would take them to the home. And I would say, listen, I know many of you have your own beliefs. But I want to let you know I was you. I may not have slammed heroin, but I still smoked meth. And the same devil that has you had me. And the only one that could set me free was Jesus. It was Jesus Christ that set me free. And I would say, and if you want that for your life, you need to give your life to Jesus. And Muslims were right there giving their life to Jesus. It's been 18 years now. There's still a victory outreach right there in the largest Muslim country in the world. Why? Because it was not a move of man. It was a move of God. They knew that what was taking place in Thessalonica was not a move of man. It was a move of God. So therefore, as a model church, as a church that is making an impact where everybody in different parts of the world are hearing about, it has to be a church that is moving in the power of God. Man can persuade, but only God can transform. How many could say praise the Lord? The second thing that I see about this church is not only was it a church that possessed power, but secondly, it was a church that protected perseverance. Sorry, not protected, practiced. Practiced perseverance. How many know that it, 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 just because you give your life to the Lord doesn't mean you're going to have a perfect life? Right? Don't set yourself up to get disappointed. The Bible says those in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. In other words, you're going to go through some stuff. Pastor Steve used to say, how do you know you're on the road to success? It's uphill all the way. He used to say, when push comes to shove, we'll see what you're made of. When times get tough, we'll see who you really are. The church of Thessalonica, despite severe suffering, practiced perseverance. How many are persevering people? That no matter how hard the devil hits, put Hey, now, come on, somebody. How many know anyone can look good shadow boxing? Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. <laughs> you put somebody in front of you, brother. Come on, somebody. Uh, some of you have taken some hits in life, in the Lord. Some of you got saved and went through some stuff. But how many thank God that the same power that changed you is the same power that has kept you? How many know you're still standing? Come on, somebody. You may not be perfect, but you're still here. You, you may not be, want be where you want to be, but you thank God you're not where you used to be. How many thank God that he's not only a saving God, but he's a keeping God? If God be before me, then who can be against me? Greater is he who lives inside of me than he that is in this world. So devil, no matter what you try to do, I got something inside of me that will protect me, that will keep me, that will keep me going forward no matter how hard it gets come on somebody it's like the apostle Paul he says uh, that he pleaded with the Lord three times take this thorn from me he says I was getting these great revelations that was given to me a messenger of Satan a thorn in my flesh you read it right some of you looking at me like what? my point is he said, his first uh, uh, communion with the Lord was, take it from me. 
But he says, then God spoke to me. He says, when you're weak, then you're strong. My grace is sufficient for you. So the apostle Paul stopped asking for God to take it away. He says, therefore, I boast all the more. When I'm going through difficult time, I get more joyful. When I'm going through hard times, I get more. Because I realize it's when I'm weak that I'm strong. When you're in your darkest moments, it's when God is right there and the closest to you. So therefore, out of maturity, he didn't ask for God to take it away no more. He said, bring it on. Come on, somebody. How many are knowing that the grace of God is sufficient for our lives? And I'm not saying that you're going to be always in a trial. If you're always in a trial, then something else is wrong. You're always in a trial like, brother, I don't know. I mean, I've been serving the Lord for a little while here. Not as long as Pastor Augie, but I've been serving the Lord for a little while. And I, yeah, I go through trial. But if all the time was a trial, I got to say, my God. I got to be like Michael Jackson and say, I'm looking at the man in the mirror. <laughs> I got to start looking at why am I always in trials? Why is everyone else in victory and I'm still in trial? There's probably something that God wants to deal with within my life. So he's allowed me to go through a little season. But even though when he allows seasons, his grace is sufficient. Even when we go through certain times, serving the Lord, I would say 80%. Blessed, blessed, 80%, maybe 70, come on somebody, you know when we preach sometimes we exaggerate a little bit, come on somebody, uh, forgive us Lord, hallelujah, my point is, not every season's a trial, most of my seasons, are big. even in Indonesia, in the largest Muslim country, I met my wife in Indonesia, beautiful wife. I got me a good wife. Come on, someone. You can't find one of these in the barrio. Come on, somebody. You got to go all the way and risk your life type of wife. Come on, somebody. You got to lay your life on the line type of wife. Hallelujah. So in the midst of turmoil, I found my wife. In the midst of turmoil, I was given two beautiful little kids. So my, even in the midst of madness, God is still good to us. How many know that God is a faithful God? And so therefore my point is, all of Christianity is not a trial. But you will have to practice perseverance at certain times. You will. God's power will transform you. Right? So you don't get entangled in the things that you used to do. But when you're serving the Lord, there's also times. Hey, come on. Come on, somebody. Don't get all crazy, though. In your prayer closet, some of you are like that. You want sword? In other words, you're I'm just making fun because keep you with me. In other words, there's times where you gotta press in a little bit. You can't just hope the thing passes by. You got you gotta be able to dig in a little more in prayer and you. And knowing and understanding that the God that I serve is a faithful God. And I'm not going to allow this trial. I'm not going to allow this difficult time. I'm not going to allow this season rob me from my next season. I'm not going to allow this time to rob me from my next time. How many know there's another chapter coming? There's a breakthrough on the way. That child is going to get saved. That marriage is going to get restored. Don't you give up now and miss out on the blessings of tomorrow. I've seen so many people walk away. Right before the miracle. Right before the miracle. Why? Because the devil hits the hardest right before the breakthrough. How many are going to hold on just a little longer? Come on, somebody. Through the grace of God. Hallelujah. This church not only had power, but they also practiced perseverance. That in difficult times, they didn't give up. And they didn't throw in the towel. Through the grace of God, they were able to endure certain seasons. When, Despite severe suffering, the Bible says, the message rang out from you. And nothing determined or nothing dictated their worship. Nothing dictated their service. They were not up and down Christians. Come on, somebody. How many have ever had? And, and if you're newer, yeah, we get it. Well, I cried. I was a crybaby. I was one of those complaining Christians for about three years. Come on, somebody. Why this? Why that? That's how I was. When I first came in, I was, why this? Why that? That was me. 
And that's some of you, so don't look at me like that. Hallelujah. <laughs> so in the beginning, we get it. But at some point, come on, somebody. At some point, you got to shift. Hallelujah. And there's got to be a new level of maturity. Hey, I mean, when the baby cries, uh, Juliet, when she cries, it's so cute, right? Wee, 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 wee. They have like a weird cry, right? But when she's 14 and she still cries like that, it's not cute no more. <laughs> Changing the first diaper is like, wow, this is my baby. Look at the poo-poo. It's so cute. Come on, somebody. But if that baby's five years old, still wearing a diaper, something's not right. Same in the spirit. As you're growing in the Lord, the things that used to get you down don't get you down anymore. The things that used to discourage you don't discourage you no more. Because you have a new understanding that the God that is with me will never leave me nor forsake me. There's a new level of maturity that begins to take place. And they learn to practice perseverance. My third point, and I close with this. Some of you say close with anything. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Is that not only did they possess power. Secondly, not only did they practice perseverance. But thirdly, they protected their pursuit. See, there's a difference between a believer and a pursuer. In, the, in, in the Acts, there was no difference. The believer was a pursuer. But I think throughout the years, the definition of believer has gotten a little watered down. I think that we've got a little, you know, as long as I'm comfortable over here. Come on, I'm going to step on some toes, that all right? I know it's that Sunday morning, like, oh, brother, don't go there. Hallelujah. But sometimes we can get a little comfortable in our Christianity. And there's no longer that pursuing of God's presence, pursuing that hunger, that urgency, that sense of Jesus can come back at any time. The book of Acts never lost their pursuit because their belief was Jesus can come back any time. But nowadays, it's like Peter. They say, you've been saying Jesus is going to come back for a long time. But the book of Peter says, God is not a God that he shall lie, but he's patient. Not wanting none to perish. I don't know about you, but I thank God Jesus didn't come back in 1998. Come on, somebody. Let me bring it home a little bit. This is a whole different message. I don't know what I'm talking about right now. I think the comfort comes to the body because we lose perspective in the truth. Just because Jesus hasn't come back doesn't mean he's not coming back. The book of Peter prophesies to us that many will say, you know, you guys have been saying Jesus is going to come back for a long time. But where's he at? And then Peter answers, he says, God is not a God that he shall lie. He's patient with you. Not wanting none to perish. Although some will. But his heart is that none would perish. So I thank God he didn't come back in 1998. I was still Jurassic Park in 1998. <laughs> I think I was in the county in 1998 for the fifth time. Come on, somebody. If he would have came back, I would be in hell. <laughs> Some of you thank God he didn't come back in 2002. Some of you thank God he didn't come back in 2004. Some of you still have a son out there. Some of you still have a husband out there. Some of you still have family members that are out there. And so now you should in your heart thank God that he hasn't come back yet. And the reason he hasn't come back is because he's waiting for that son. It's because he's waiting for that. He's like the father waiting for the prodigal son. He's standing on the door and he's ready to come back and he's looking into the future. He's looking prophetically at people's families making it into the house of God. But just at the right time Jesus will come back like a twinkling in the eye and he will come with that sound of a trumpet and he will live that needs to be the urgency and when that's the urgency of the church there's a pursuit pursuing God's will 
There's a drive in the church. That's what our founders have. That's what our pastors have. That's what our elders have. That's why when you go around Pastor Sonny, he's always watching the news. He's looking for Daniel to come to pass. He's looking for that horn to rise. He's looking for that leader that's going to come, that, 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 that anti-Christ type of spirit to come. Why? Because there's a spirit of urgency in his heart. So therefore, he's planting churches. He's building bases. He's going to Panama. And he says, if Jesus is patient, not wanting none to perish, I need to do my job while I'm still here on planet Earth. That needs to be the conviction of the church but sometimes we get a little comfortable but the church of Thessalonica was a church that possessed power practiced perseverance and never got comfortable protected their pursuit and I believe a pursuing church and I close with this musicians can make their way I did pretty good on time huh? I'm getting good at this hallelujah you know, we got three services in Cape Town. The first one's an hour and 15 minutes, Pastor Augie. They try to not get me to preach there. Because I blow it every time. Hallelujah. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Possess power. You got power. That's why you're not the same person you used to be. When you look in the mirror, right? Do you like who you see? And if you don't, you need this altar call. Because you are beautifully... Created in God's image. You're, and if you can't see that, you need new breakthrough in your life. I thank God when I was in those motels, man, I'd be looking at myself. I look bad, boy. I look like I got socked in the nose. I had a big black eye. <laughs> Come on, somebody. And I remember hating who I seen. I remember just dodging the mirror. But when God got a hold of my life, Sometimes I take it a little too long, Pastor Augie. Come on. I say, boy, you, not only is, am I lucky with Chica, but Chica's lucky with me. Come on, my <laughs> And you may not think that, but God has given me a love for myself. I can love myself again because I'm not the person I used to be. I've been transformed by the power of God. But is this life easy? No. Is there going to be downtimes? Yes. So not only has power transformed me, but power helps me persevere. I could take a hit. Boom. hoo -yah! In the spirit. I've learned to... Ooh. I've learned to shake off the feelings. I've learned to walk by faith and not by sight. I've learned to trust when it didn't look like it was going to happen. I learned to trust when I had no idea how God was going to come through but I knew that he was faithful and therefore I would persevere and trust and now I'm still trying to protect my pursuit is there temptation to get comfortable? yes is there temptation to just yeah. yes but I got to keep my perspective this is not my home earth is not my home Heaven is my home. And so therefore, like the Apostle Paul, I will try to apprehend that which has apprehended me. I will live a pursuing life with a freshness in my heart. And I believe the pursuit of a Christian is the result of their surrender. When a person is surrendered, I want to sing that song. I surrender all. You guys can make your way. Hallelujah. How many appreciate this beautiful music team? Come on. And hey, they come a long way since the last time I was here. The miracle. Hallelujah. See, there's a difference in your walk with God of submission and surrender. I believe this is a new transition for shift, if you will. When you shift from a submitted Christian to a surrendered Christian. Because submission will keep you in the game. But there's another level past submission. The Bible says, submit to God and resist the devil. Right? And what will happen? He'll flee. Persevere. Submit. But after he flees, draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. I believe that Jesus, 
went into the garden, submitted to God. 100% man, 100% God. I believe the 100% God, of course he is. He was already surrendered. He was God. But the human side, how many know we all got a sinful nature? Come on, somebody. The Bible says we have two natures. Spiritual man and the sinful man. And they're in battle with each other. And when Jesus went into the garden, his human side was submitted to God. Then he started praying for three different times, for an hour at a time. He says, God, if you can take this cup from me, submit it to God. But then his prayer began to transition. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He went into the garden, submitted, but he carried the cross, surrendered. Oh my God. He went into the garden, submitted. Some of you showed up this morning, submitted. Your victory over the devil and over the attacks and over the different things you go through are not just in your submission, but are in your surrender. I surrender all. Not my will, but your will be. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. When you can shift into this new dimension, then my friend, there is a consistency in the joy that you have. There's a consistency in the peace that you have. Because you are a surrendered vessel in the hands of God. And the Bible says if any man or woman shall be cleansed of the latter, they will be a vessel, perfect and useful in my hand. I believe God is raising up Victory Outreach Eagle Rock to be a vessel in his hand, perfect and useful for every great work. If you believe it, I need you to clap just a little bit. I surrender, I surrender, I surrender my life, oh God. I want you to stand to your feet. They possess power. They practice perseverance. And they protected their pursuit. Their pursuit of God and his will for their life. I'm not sure where you're at this morning. Maybe you need an experience with his power. Maybe you still struggle. When you leave here, you go back and you struggle to have victory. You struggle to overcome. God wants to release his power over your life this morning. Maybe you're struggling in your perseverance. Maybe you're going through some trials right now. Going through a little bit of a difficult time. Same power that changed you is the same power that will keep you. And maybe you've gotten a little comfortable this morning. Maybe you've gotten a little laid back in your walk with God. God wants to stir up that gift. God wants to stir up that pursuit. If that's you, you say, you know what? God spoke to me this morning. I want to get in that altar this morning. Lift up your hand if that's you all over this place. Lift up your hand. Lift up your hand and show me and say, that's me. God spoke to me this morning. I want you to pray for me this morning. Lift up your hand nice and high so I can see it. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. God bless you, God bless you. God bless you, God bless you. Listen, if you've lifted up your hand, I want you to take a second step as we sing this song. I want you to slip out of that seat and I want you to make your way into this altar. Come on. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Even when
going to get ready to take this from the beginning. But listen, I believe there's still some of you in your seats. And, and you just need prayer this morning. You need, you came for a reason. You have a, you have something that you're going through in your life. There's something that you're facing. There's Maybe no one knows about it. It's between you and, and now it's between you and God. You say, you know what, I just need prayer this morning. I'm, I'm just starting this journey or I've been in it for a while. Going through something personal right now and I just, I just need someone to pray for me right now. I just need someone to pray for me. If that's you, lift up your hands. That's me, that's me. Just be honest, just be honest. God bless you. God bless you. That's why we're here. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. There's a lot of hands that went up and you're still there in your seat. Listen, I want to encourage you. I'm not trying to embarrass you, but I know that special things happen in these altars. My life was changed in these altars. If you lifted up your hand and you're not yet in this altar, I want you to just slip out of your seat. Come. Come by faith. That's it. Come on and come. Come on and come. God's a miracle working God. He's a He's a faith. He knew you were going to show up this morning. He knew you were going to be here. He, he knows what you're going through. And he's a good God. He takes care of us. Come on and come. Come on and come. Come on and come. I want you to sing it from the top. Sing it from the top. Come on and come from all over this place. You need prayer. You say, I need prayer. I need, I need a breakthrough in my life, man. I'm going through something. I, I need that breakthrough. I need that supernatural. I've tried everything. And I need a breakthrough in my life. Come on and come. Come on and come. I said, just close your eyes. Remember, man can't do it. I can't do it. The church can't do it. There's the God of the church. Jesus Christ. He's the way maker. Hey! He's the way maker. It's only Jesus. It's only Jesus. It's only Jesus. Close your eyes and lift up your hands. Lift up your hands. God is here. It's not nothing a man can do. It's, it's a personal touch from Jesus. 
Man didn't change me. Jesus changed me. Man didn't keep me. Jesus has kept me. Hallelujah. Come on, lift up your hands. That's it. Just take a few more moments. God, I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Moving in our midst. I worship you. visit us at vioigarok.org.